Some of you may have seen the video on this channel's picks for the top 5 best Civil War movies. Folks generally agree with my including Gettysburg on the top 5 list. Spoiler alert. But a lot of folks have taken exception to my leaving out gods and generals. I promised folks that I'd explain why, so here we are. The 1993 movie Gettysburg and the 2003 prequel Gods and Generals were both produced by Ted Turner, directed by Ron Maxwell, adapted from best-selling historical novels, and populated by extras who are obviously Civil War reenactors and passionate about the subject. On top of that, while Gettysburg had a catchy instrumental soundtrack, Gods and Generals had a beautiful soundtrack worthy of cinema, including haunting vocals by Mary Fall and a new song by Bob Dylan, which is good. All of this is a recipe for success, right? Well, not really. The passion that all the above-named parties shared for the subject matter provides some key ingredients for success, but there's more to the recipe. Believe it or not, I like Gods and Generals. That has more to do with the likable characters we met in Gettysburg and a superb performance by Stephen Lang. Plus, I just plain like Civil War content, just the same as you do, and for a while, this was one of the few Civil War movies with modern cinematic production quality and one of the only movies covering certain battles, period. That said, storytelling is the most important part of a movie. The theatrical version of Gods and Generals is a mess. There's way too much content and too much chronology that it tries to pack into three and a half hours. So instead of a select few coherent story arcs that we can focus on, harmoniously woven together into one larger story, the movie turns into a chaotic chain of one unrelated scene after another, until General Jackson is suddenly mortally wounded, cut and done, roll credits. I like the extended director's cut a lot better. Its runtime is 4 hours and 39 minutes, and it has title cards dividing it into 5 acts. That gives it the feel of a TV miniseries, and I watched it over 3 nights, which makes it a lot more bearable. The extended runtime gives other characters besides General Jackson some of the spotlight, so their personal plot arcs are better developed, even if most of the side plots are totally irrelevant to Stonewall Jackson or to helping the main characters do something meaningful to advance the plot. The extended cut is still a mess, but a more orderly mess than the theatrical version. That said, most of the people who saw Gods and Generals did not see this improved version, they saw the 2003 version, in theaters, or the following year they watched it on HBO and Showtime, or they rented it from the local video store. There were a number of reasons why Gettysburg worked and Gods and Generals didn't. As I said, good storytelling is the most important thing in a movie. It doesn't require a huge budget. Most of The Breakfast Club takes place in two or three rooms in one school, but it's a great story about people learning to trust each other and to forgive themselves for their shortcomings. The Red Balloon has no dialogue or even title cards like most silent movies, but there is a clear plot and story arc. Gettysburg had a large celebrity cast and a runtime of over four hours, but it really focused on a handful of main characters. That combo makes room for good storytelling. Because the movie follows these few characters in one specific battle, most of the characters get all the screen time they need to tell a good story arc within a timeline of just a few days. They only have to grow a little bit for the sake of their story arcs, yet for some characters like the Chamberlain brothers, the growth is profound. Also, the actors were appropriately aged in 1993 to play their historical figures, which is a different case in the prequel movie. Here's where Gods and Generals was set up not to succeed before it was even adapted into a movie. The novel The Killer Angels focuses on character arcs within one battle, so most of the characters get plenty of play. But Gods and Generals takes place over two years of the war, so now the filmmakers have the burden of working with an even bigger cast of characters, and working all those battles into the story in a way that relevantly advances the plotline and meaningfully develops multiple character arcs. The Gods and Generals novel manages to pull this off, but the film adaptation strays a lot from its source material. It has more speeches than the book, spends way more time and resources on the first battle of Manassas, and leaves out multiple other Civil War battles and individual character struggles that are in the book in order to give Stonewall Jackson way more time in the spotlight than Jeff Shara gave him. Only a few scenes from the novel actually made it into the movie. The rest of what we see is Ron Maxwell's original story, with Maxwell's own interpretations of the Shara's interpretations of these historical characters. Unlike Gettysburg, which clearly conveys a story of how one battle affected a handful of characters and that's all, Gods and Generals tries to be three different things at once. First, this is unquestionably Stonewall Jackson the movie. I like all the Stonewall Jackson scenes because Stephen Lang is a superb actor, even if the character was written to be Confederate Superman, and not true to the real guy. Unfortunately, the film plays him up at the expense of other main characters and their internal conflicts. For example, in the book, General Hancock worries often about the day he'll have to face his friend Lou Armistead in battle, and Robert E. Lee spends a lot of time missing his home. 
This homesick man aging prematurely in a war he didn't actually believe in at first makes for an interesting character that contrasts with the stoic public figure most of us know. Then there's Joshua Chamberlain overcoming his inexperience. He's the only one of the four main characters who wasn't already a soldier, and it takes him longer to learn how to do his job. Then he's suddenly thrust in the role of regimental commander in battle, and he's not ready for it. This would have been more productive content than Stonewall Jackson drinking sweet tea, or the officers having a Christmas party, and it would have set up Chamberlain for making a positive leadership decision at the beginning of Gettysburg with the 120 prisoners. While trying to be a movie about Stonewall Jackson, Gods and Generals is also presented as a chronicle of major historical events. That's why it includes Virginia secession and then two years worth of battles and occupations. That concept could work on its own, but then the movie detracts from advancing the main character's story arcs in order to focus on these side dramas like Martha's Stockholm Syndrome with her owners, or the kid that hangs out with Stonewall Jackson. Jim Lewis is relevant because his softly challenging General Jackson on slavery creates internal conflict for the character, who's a slave owner. However, the slave Martha and her owners, the little girl at the plantation, the soldiers lifted directly from Company H who are somehow now in the Army of Northern Virginia and not Tennessee, and John Wilkes Booth are all totally unnecessary characters. They have nothing to do with the main character's actions in winning or losing battles in the story, or in triumphing over personal demons. I really like the scene of the Yankee and the Rebel trading tobacco and coffee at the river because it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. But that's really just a filler scene and it does nothing for the plot or the main characters. It only exists so some Civil War nerds with a studio budget could recreate a famous illustration for other Civil War nerds to gawk over. Mission accomplished. The scene could have been relevant if the Union soldier had come back to camp and given a pinch of pipe tobacco to General Hancock. And the talk of trading with the rebels would have given the general a chance to have a candid conversation with this private about his old friend Lou Armistead who's on the other side. Or the soldier could have offered a puff to Colonel Chamberlain as he passes by. And in a moment of doubting his leadership ability, Chamberlain asks the soldier his opinion of the situation on the ground. Third. The movie tries to be the prequel to Gettysburg, with main characters on both sides and a balance between northern and southern views. This time around though, it doesn't work. Gettysburg gives limited speech time to what each side is fighting for and mostly just shows human beings on both sides reacting to the constantly changing situation. Gods and Generals goes full Star Wars prequels by spending a lot of time on civilian politics, at the state legislature, at VMI, and in the towns. The film also burns a lot of time on multiple military political speeches and monologues, plus romantic poetry, plus Roman monologues, plus Shakespearean monologues. There are arguments for putting Fanny Chamberlain at the beginning, since her poor reaction to Chamberlain's commission in the army creates internal conflict in a main character. Plus, Mira Sorvino is absurdly beautiful, so that doesn't hurt. But the Chamberlain's theater scene was filler, not substance. Besides, we already saw a secret reunion between Yankee and Rebel near the battlefield, so the meeting of Yankees and Rebels at a DC playhouse is already way less cool. Ultimately, having a whole bunch of pro-secession speeches works for Stonewall Jackson the movie, but not for a chronicle of the first half of the war. General Jackson is not Pericles. The speeches did not matter. The battles after the speeches are what mattered. Also, what happened to General Armistead? He's a main character in Gettysburg, but he barely gets any screen time in the prequel. I understand he's not a main character in the prequel novel, but the book isn't Stonewall Jackson the novel either. If this is the prequel to Gettysburg, then Armistead needs at least some screen time where he solemnly shares the same fear as his friend General Hancock about having to face each other in battle. The prequel film does not succeed in being a balanced, unbiased movie like Gettysburg. Ultimately, all the poetry, monologues, and sad Irishmen are just fluff, and most of the political and social views voiced in the movie are from a squeaky clean southern perspective that focuses on defending hearth and home and not on maintaining human property, which is what most of the southern states actually talk about in their secession declarations. There is no other character shown in as much depth as Stonewall Jackson, aka Superman, so his secession views get the most airtime. That's true to the real general's views, but not to having an unbiased prequel that sets the audience up for Gettysburg. The movie could have been about Stonewall Jackson, it could have been a chronicle about the great deeds of four main characters from the book, or it could have been the prequel to Gettysburg with a balanced play-by-play -play of a few battles and moments around camp and nothing else. But it tries to be three totally different movies at the same time, and these three movies neither make a trilogy nor work together to make one movie. 
there are a few specific things about the movie's production and writing that I really disagree with. Right from the start, the regimental flags at the beginning don't work. Every one of those flags waving in the breeze in a studio is beautifully shot. They really do look great. And Mary's song is hauntingly beautiful and appropriate to the overarching theme of the movie. But the visuals get boring after about 30 seconds. In contrast, the opening credits to Gettysburg give the audience a fun game. We get to judge for ourselves how much the actors look like the historical figures they're playing. But in the prequel, we get 5 minutes of regimental flags. They could have literally done the same side-by-side -side photo thing in the prequel movie and it would have worked. Another sticking point for me is how the director had an acting legend in Robert Duvall, yet Robert E. Lee has the same facial expression throughout the entire movie. The real General Lee got pissed off and snapped at people a lot, but Duvall was handed a script and directed to be a poker-faced caricature of the general. Misusing Robert Duvall that way is like having a classic hot rod just to drive it 5 miles an hour around the block. Next, Harrison did not need to be in the prequel film. In Gettysburg, he's interesting and relevant. He's a rebel spy, and eventually becomes a fighting volunteer. He struggles with imposter syndrome, being a civilian and not a soldier, yet he overcomes his fears and faces the elephant in Pickett's charge. In the prequel, he's not doing Jeb Stewart's job by bringing General Lee new intel about Yankee troop movements. He's acting on stage. His whole purpose in the prequel movie is to keep handing the microphone over to John Wilkes Booth, just so we can watch him not shoot Abraham Lincoln. I really like Denzali Abernathy's performance as Martha. She's a damn good actress and it doesn't hurt that she's really easy on the eyes. That said, Martha is another unnecessary character. Her only contribution to the shared story of the main characters fighting in the war is opening the door for General Hancock, while her character mostly gives off vibes that slavery wasn't that bad. I won't say her character is inaccurate. The Stockholm Syndrome was common among slaves who were well-fed and who generally weren't beaten or physically punished. Plus, having small children complicates the logistics of escaping north. But we shouldn't miss the forest to look at one tree. We see Martha living in a beautiful house, talking about how she loves her owners, and not running away. But we don't see any of the millions of field hands eating with their hands out of a trough, working long hours, and getting whipped. That type of scenery would have backed up Chamberlain's speech about how slavery is bad, and how even though he's here to preserve the Union, war sorts things out. Martha's character has done a great disservice because her plot arc is irrelevant to the main characters, while the historical accuracies of her character are used to give an inaccurate impression of history. It's not only bad history, but it seriously detracts from the Gettysburg-style unbiased approach. It is correct history to tell us what Lee and Jackson believe, but it's not correct history to only show the softer side of slavery. Mrs. Corbin, the southern matriarch who owns Martha is also unnecessary and has no plot advancing interactions with the main characters. Plus, I didn't like the character or the casting choice. The actress delivers great Shakespearean stage acting, but that exaggerated style of acting that's necessary for the audience to see and hear from the 300th row doesn't translate well from stage to screen. Kenneth Branagh does not do Shakespeare on film the way he does Shakespeare on stage. And don't even get me started on that ridiculous monologue about the hungry Irishman from the potato famine who died at Fredericksburg. It's so over the top, I cannot take it the least bit seriously. That one's on the writer-director, not on the miscast stage actress who was handed a script with this ultra-corny dialogue. I appreciate that Mr. Maxwell gave it the old college try in including black confederates, but I really disagree with how they were used and what message it conveys. Jim Lewis is a cool character, Frankie Faison is a good actor, and this supporting character is relevant to developing the main character of Stonewall Jackson the movie. But this fictional version of Jim isn't used honestly. The movie is vague about his legal status, but the first few times I watched it, I got the impression that Jim Lewis enlisted in the Confederate Army as a cook, and the interwebs have proven that I'm not alone there. The real Jim Lewis did often cook in the camp, but he only cooked for General Jackson because Lewis was his body servant. He was neither a soldier, nor one of the many black enlisted cooks or musicians. He was hired out to the general by his owner, W.C. Lewis, who also lived in Lexington, like the general. We don't see Jackson paying W.C. Lewis for use of his slave. We just see Jim in a job interview talking about wanting to do his share in the war. I also don't dig how his moral challenge of slavery during prayer segues into, hey, they're talking in the camp about black Confederate soldiers. No, not in the Army of Northern Virginia in 1862 they're not. In the Army of Tennessee, maybe, for five minutes, before that talk was squashed by Bragg, and squashed again by Jeff Davis. The other black confederate in the movie is an unnecessary character. We already have a body servant in Jim, 
so we don't even get to see a variety of jobs and combat zones available to black southerners. It would've been way cooler if they'd at least made this guy a drummer who's war-weary and struggling over whether to desert or not. This guy doesn't pass along critical intel, doesn't save anyone important, doesn't kill anyone important, doesn't make any main characters into morally complicated men, he doesn't even have a name. He just exists to tell the audience that his confederate owner freed him and now pays him wages. That was true in a lot of cases, but overwhelmingly most body servants were slaves, even if their employer was not their owner. Most of the time their owners collected their wages, and most of these slaves were not freed until the late spring of 1865. Jeff Shara didn't write this character, Ron Maxwell did. Another gripe I have is the Antietam scene. We get a short, bloodless skirmish at Miller's Cornfield, then the armies are on the march again. This is the first of two times that Lee invades Union territory, and it isn't used to shake Lee or Jackson's confidence and build up their desperation to win a decisive victory. This scene is really just eye candy for Civil War addicts to get a piece of a particular flavor they'd been missing in Civil War movies before. The time spent on this fluff scene would have been better spent dramatically foreshadowing events to come at Gettysburg. Or the time would have been better spent on developing some of the Union and Confederate Irish characters, whom we meet literally at the Battle of Fredericksburg, and we have no reason to care about any of them as characters. They look impressively 1862, and we can see that they're sad, but they're strangers to the audience. Then there's the biggest drawback, which is visual, so it's always there. This film is a prequel that was made a full decade after the movie it's based on, so all the returning actors have aged visibly. There's no hiding it. Some of them even have gray hair in the prequel when they didn't in Gettysburg. This undermines the chronological continuity between the prequel and the original movie that comes next in the saga's timeline. I'll also never get over the miscasting of General Hood. The real guy was 34 when the war ended, but the actor cast to play him looks like he's pushing 60 in Gettysburg, and pushing 300 in Gods and Generals. That's not cool. All in all, I still like the movie Gods and Generals, despite its many deep flaws, because I just can't get enough Civil War content. I even started this channel because there wasn't any video content on many of the Civil War stories I wanted to hear told. Despite its less than subtle lost cause bias, the movie is made with the intention of giving Civil War buffs something to endlessly debate over as modern America verbally refights the Civil War for all eternity. In most of these regards, the movie delivers. I know the movie will always have a cult following, and I'm reluctant to admit that includes me. After all, I spent money to own it not once, not twice, but three times. The cult following doesn't change that the movie has deep flaws in its book-to-film adaptation, in its story arcs, in several of its casting decisions, and in the highly inaccurate historical interpretation of America at war with itself. These are the reasons why Gods and Generals didn't make this channel's list of the top 5 best Civil War movies. There are at least five films that are way better flicks than Gods and Generals, including one that stuck closely to its source material. I doubt there will ever be an adaptation of The Last Full Measure, the third book in the trilogy. Not because Ted Turner lost many millions of dollars on Gods and Generals and isn't interested in taking the risk again, but because of mistakes made in the adaptation of the prequel film that Jeff Shara won't allow to happen to his work again. However, I could see a sequel movie happening if Jeff Shara was in charge of the adaptation, and recruited a veteran independent film producer to get the financing, and a veteran indie filmmaker to direct the adaptation that follows the novel closely, and with an all-new cast, appropriately aged. Even if it's a flop, which I highly doubt, then much like Comic Book Guy with the Cosmic Wars prequels, Worst Cosmic Wars ever! I will only see it three more times, today! I would complain endlessly while still paying to go see it. Thank you for watching the Civil War Wild West Edition, and if you haven't seen the video on the top 5 best Civil War movies, you can check it out now. Plus, check out some of these other videos on interesting topics you never saw on the History Channel.